Praise the Lord. Get this down. is the 37th day countdown until Lena turns 18. God is so good. This is February the 25th, 2023. And we just came in, maybe like, how long it been, y'all, since we came in for the outreach? 30 minutes, probably. Probably like 30 minutes or more from doing outreach. And um, so I have my granddaughter, Kamara, here, which is Lena's niece. So she's going to help us, too, with some. Both of them going to pick out. They already picked out a verse they like out of Psalm 37. And um, Kamara, you lead in prayer. Whatever God put on your heart, babe, just pray to God. Lord Jesus, I thank you for today, yesterday, and tomorrow. I hope this video comes out good. And all of us have a happy day. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 Thank you. So I'm going to read Psalm 37. Don't worry about the wicked or envy those who do wrong. For like grass, they soon fade away. Like spring flowers, they soon wither. Trust in the Lord and do good. Then you will live safety in the land and prosper. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desire. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him and he will help you. He will make your innocence radiant like the dawn and the justice of your cause will shine like the noonday sun. Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret about their wicked schemes. Stop being angry. Turn from your rage. Do not lose your temper. It only leads to harm for the wicked will be destroyed but those who trust in the lord will possess the land soon the wicked will disappear though you look for them they will be gone the lowly will possess the land and will live in peace in prosperity the wicked plot against the godly they snarl at them in defiance but the lord just laughs for he sees their day of judgment coming. The wicked draw their swords and string their bows to kill the poor and the oppressed, to slaughter those who do right. But their swords will stab their own hearts and their bows will be broken. It is better to be godly and have little than to be evil and rich. For the strength of the wicked will be shattered but the Lord takes care of the godly. Day by day, the Lord takes care of the innocent. And they will receive an inheritance that lasts forever. They will not be disgraced in hard times. Even in famine, they will have more than enough. But the wicked will die. The Lord's enemies are like flowers in a field. They will disappear like smoke. The wicked borrow and never repay. But the godly are generous givers. Those the Lord blesses will possess the land, but those he curses will die. The Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. Though they stumble, they will never fall, for the Lord holds them up by the hand. Once I was young and now I am old, yet I've never seen the godly abandoned or their children begging for bread. The godly always give generous loans to others and their children are a blessing. Turn from evil and do good and you will live in the land forever. For the Lord loves justice. And he will never abandon the godly. He will keep them safe forever. But the wicked, but the children of the wicked will die. The godly will possess the land and will live there forever. The godly offer good counsel. They teach right from wrong. They have made God's law their own. So they will never slip from his path. The wicked wait in ambush. For the godly looking for an excuse to kill them. But the Lord will not let the wicked 
succeed or let the godly be condemned when they are put on trial. Put your hope in the Lord. Travel steadily along his path. He will honor you by giving you the land. You will see the wicked destroyed. I have seen wicked and ruthless people flourishing like a tree in a native soil. But when I looked again, they were gone. Though I searched for them, I could not find them. Look at those who are honest and good. For a wonderful future awaits those who have peace. For a wonderful future awaits those who love peace. But the rebellious will be destroyed. They have no future. The Lord rescues the godly. He is their fortress in times of trouble. The Lord helps them, rescuing them from the wicked. He saves them and they find shelter in him. Blessing. I thank the Lord for reading this. Now I'm going to let them come and tell you which verse that they like. The verse I chose after Psalm 27 was the third one. Trust the Lord and do good. Live in the land and enjoy its safety. So what it's saying is when you trust, trust the Lord, you know, he will make sure that no weapon can hurt you. Like <clears throat> what others do for harm will come back to good. I pray Psalms 27 8. Don't get angry. Don't get upset. It only leads to trouble. I think it means whatever you really do, it's going to come back to you in a bad way. Okay. So it, it was saying about angry. So what did that say about the angry? Like, don't get angry. So how you prevent yourself from getting angry? Even like when your sisters or somebody doing something to you, how are you going to prevent yourself from getting really angry? I try to calm down and act so nicely to not do that. Right, because if you get angry, it'll lead to trouble like it says. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. So, we're not going to take a lot of y'all time. We've been doing outreach. So, on one of the other videos, if you look at it, you will see what we've been doing on, on this day countdown. But I'm going to ask questions um, to them. And so, Lena, stand in front of her. Um, from us doing the outreach to helping the homeless, uh, could you please elaborate on that? Um, about how do you feel about giving back, not just to the homeless, but to everyone that's in need, and also helping people that needs help. How do you feel about that? Um, and your experience, and also I want to know. How was your experience um, when you first went out to Tent City and seeing that some people was living like that? Because you didn't know that people actually lived like that all your life. You know, like when it was really, really freezing cold. You remember y'all saying when the winter time came, y'all said, now nah, I know they ain't living outside in the cold like this. You know, when it's almost freezing weather, but you found out that they were. So elaborate on what you was thinking when you went out there in Tent City to actually see people living out there. Some just sleeping on the ground, not even having a tent. Tell me how did that um, affect you? What did you think? And how did that change your perspective and outlook on life? And how did that change you as a person and your behavior and the things that you said and did and just even... Um, how did that make you feel about the things that you have and even your own room? And and also, I want to ask you, do you ever think about the homeless? Like, when we get done with the outreach, um, do it ever come to your mind that somebody is out there sleeping in the streets? Um, someone is out there, like, elaborate on it. Um... I really think about the homeless people sometimes, like, when it's really hot and it's really cold, like, when they're just not, like, you know, warm, or it's not, like, both hot and cold, I just be like, you know, because sometimes they be passing out, or they even freezing to death, and, you know, they don't got a house where they can change the temperature, you know, the AC, they can cut the air on, they can cut the heat on, they don't have a house to do that, they just, they live outside so yeah and um 
my first time seeing it, I was kind of scared. Because, you know, in movies, you know, like the homeless people, they used to be reckless and stuff. So that's why I thought they was, you know, I just thought they was reckless. So that's why, you know, it took me a minute to actually go inside. That's why I didn't want to go inside. But when I actually did, you know, so far we really had met anybody like that. So for them to be homeless, they still have a bit hard, you know. They do be grateful, as far as I can tell. They be grateful, and what was the other question? How they make you uh, treat the, uh, like value the things that you have, and do you take your stuff for granted or things for granted or home for granted now? Uh, I don't take home for granted no more because, you know, it could be an instant. You know, something can happen, the stock market can crash, uh, a tornado can happen, and we can lose our home and be just like them. Mm -hmm. So, I don't really, you know, do that. And it showed me that I do have to take care of myself more because everything has value to it. And the people there, the stuff they do have. It might be trash to us, but to them, that's their treasure. So, yeah. Okay. Now, Kamara, you stand here. How do you feel like when you first went into Tent City, even on Charlotte Pike, the first time you ever went and seen how the homeless live, how did it make you feel, and what did you learn from that experience? When I had first um, seen the homeless, I felt bad for them because people would sleep on the ground with no with no tent to sleep in. And what was the other question? Just keep it that way. And um, that's really all. So what do you think that we can do as a whole, not just us and our family, but everyone? Like, what all you think that we could do to help the homeless? Every little, what do you think that we could do? We could put the, like, the spotlight on them and ask other people to help. Mm -hmm. and ask other people to help in person and try to give all we can to them. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, and to um, add to what Lena said about that she was scared at first because how the movies portray the homeless, like they're reckless, ruthless, but since we've been going out to do the outreach, we never encountered anyone that harmed us in any kind of way. Actually, they surprised us because one of the volunteers had lost her phone, and it was a homeless person that found her iPhone and gave it back to her. And also, um, we had donated some clothes, and my husband' debit card was in one of those um clothes and some of those clothes the pockets and stuff and it was a homeless person that actually gave me back that card um and it was uh let me see more occasions than even that that we have really been blessed by the homeless and been helped too so god is good okay now lena i want to ask you what is your um biggest challenge I already asked you about what is your fear on yesterday. But what do you think would be your biggest challenge to transitioning from becoming a, a teenager to a young adult? Go right ahead. Bills and saving money. Bills and saving money. Yeah. Because I probably what I need to do now, you know, probably like to help me get there is like stop paying for my phone bill. Like, like when I get a job, they're like helping out with the rent. They'll probably help me. So I'm like, okay, I got to lose every month. But then I, you know, the calculation on it. Okay. Kamara, what is your biggest challenge um, from you nine years old, finna turn two digits, um, 10 years old this year? So you would not, you would never be in a one digit again. You will, you know, be in the two digits for most of your life now. 
So what do you think would be the biggest challenge where you become a, a almost like a preteen? What's the transition and the challenge that you think you'll be facing? Um, how to like talk to people that I don't know. And also, I wanted to say, my auntie had told me, 10 years is known as a decade. Right, a whole decade. And then I'll be known to be on, on the earth for a decade. Oh, wow, that is beautiful. That is beautiful. Okay. So, I was going to ask y'all, since God have uh, laid on my heart for y'all to, not just y'all, but to ask people to write a personal letter to the homeless and put it in their backpack, a letter of encouragement, and also a letter of one uh, showing your favorite scripture, writing it on there, telling why in your testimony of encouragement. Do you think, um, so I want you to tell a short, just a very short testimony of what you know something uh, the way that you experienced like when you had a home or something that you thought that you were going to live there forever and then you abruptly had to move or maybe had to stay in a hotel for a while like how it made you feel and what did you do to get through it and like what did you learn from it and how can you encourage others to get through this you can go first lena um, go stand in front of them How I, because we had to, what I did, I really, you know, I was young, so I really didn't know about the situation. Like, I knew, but y'all made it where y'all didn't show it. So we made it where we didn't show that we were stressed out. Yeah. Yeah, we was acting like, we weren't really acting. It was just like, hey, we're in love. So it, it didn't even done on us. Ah, oh, we, you know, yeah, because we was so in love. You know, me and your daddy was so in love. So it, you felt it out. It radiated out. So it didn't. It it put a cover over the situation that hey, we actually ain't got really a, a home of our own. Mm -hmm. We stand in this. And so, what was the fun memories about it then? I remember. I don't even really know his name. Well, we know they had two dogs. It was, it was the four dogs. You talking about Jimmy? Yeah, Jimmy. And we were we it was it was on Fourth of July, and then we went. It was like they neighbors, and we did the fireworks. Mhm. Mm that was a fun memory. So that made you feel fun, cause they you know, yeah, cause they knew how to have hospitality and make people feel like my house is your house, and so mm -hmm. yeah, they did. Yes, we did. I remember that. And I know. Was when grandma and got it, they let me drive their car. Okay, and that my was age. fun. Yeah, so that meant you weren't sad moving here from Memphis? Because you remember what about the dogs? Because we had to give up the dogs. I, I still cry. Every time I think about them dogs, I'm like, are they okay? Did they die? Did somebody run over them? Like, and then I just be like, Cause you know, every time we get new dogs, you know that dog purpose? You know that movie? Mm hmm. How, like, the dog keep... Trying to find home. Yeah. Yes. So, every time we get a new dog, I'm like, what, Rocky and Sassy? I'm, see, I'm, I ain't gonna run it in. I be doing that to every dog we got. See, see, see they're gonna jump on me or something. Um, yeah. So, how would you encourage others that's going through this situation that they had to be displaced from everything that they knew that was familiar and going into unfamiliar territories? What would you tell them to... Um, to help them? Um, have faith, stand your ground. Yeah, have faith and stand your ground. So that's how you got through? With, I mean, what did the, what's the natural things you did to get through? I just pretend it didn't happen. You pretend it wasn't happening? You just? Yeah, exactly, it's part of life. Part of life, okay. Okay, Camaro? What's, what's the question? Tell the experience of you moving from a home that you thought you was going to live in for good, but you had to give it up, give up your room, give up everything you knew to move somewhere else. How did it make you feel? Um, I was sad, and 
um, I had to leave most of my friends because one of my friends had moved and some more had came in. I was like really good friends with them and I had lost their numbers so I can't even really contact them no more. And I think they already had moved again and and how I can help people going through the same situation is nothing lasts forever. Oh, you said nothing lasts forever. Mm -hmm. So what you got to do, since you know nothing lasts forever, how is you going to treat everybody you see? And how is you going to do different? Since you know nothing lasts forever, like you may not see that person no more. Because if you knew that you wasn't going to see your friends again, if you knew that was your last day that you thought you was going to see them, how would you treat them? Um, I would make the best of it and try to, um, I'll, I'll probably do whatever they really wanted to do. And then after, I'll do what I want, really want to do. And if I didn't know, I would still try to make the best out of every day. Okay. That's a good example to do that. That is good. Okay. Um. Okay. We almost done. Let me see. We almost getting done quicker too. Now, Lena, since it's countdown for you, um, you know how some people, they say they do body bashing. What do they call it? Body bashing? They call it something. How do you feel about you being a teenager? How they say how teenagers are so bad on their bodies, so bad at how they look with the with the uh, pimples and yeah, acne, their hair, their teeth, their like. How can you encourage others like not to allow bullying to make them want to uh, do bad things to themselves or others just because what somebody think about them? How would you encourage someone uh, to embrace themselves? And even their culture, their, you know, the color of their skin, the color of their hair, the type of hair they got, and all, too. So. Well, when I was growing up, people made fun of me because I was skinny. And, you know, I've been called a stick, twig, toothpick, true string. I've been called all of it. But what I guess helped me was just like, y'all mad that I'm skinny. And then they would turn around and go to a fat person be like, you're fat. You like a hippo. So to me, it was just like, their probably wasn't comfortable in their skin. Because they felt like they wasn't either. That's why I feel like people make fun of fat people and skinny people. Because... They just, they just scared that they are not getting that attention. You know that some people do get from being their size. And for me, what made me comfortable was, I don't know. I just started being comfortable in my body. What age did you finally start accepting? 16. 16, accepting who you are. Yeah. Okay. That's when I, I already noticed I, I hate shorts. I absolutely hate shorts. Well, I did. I hate short my legs. Because you now I have all them scars. But then I just realized them scars got stories. So why cool. not show them? Right. Like everything has a story, you know? It's got a story. I remember I busted my knee playing outside. That got a story. Okay. And in my opinion, scars are cool. Now, come on. Now, you tell. So, yes. if somebody make fun of you, how do you react? Because my mama said what she used to do is laugh with them, and they would stop because they realized it wouldn't make it, it wouldn't get her upset. So, it wasn't no fun of them making fun of them. Go. Now, talk. Um... Mama used to call me a green bean because I was too thin and I can never pick nothing up. And she would tell me to eat more green beans. And at school, I was called um a twig, a toothpick, and a thin line. So when they made fun of me, I just um walked away and said and said nothing about it. And why is Eddie on the floor? 
because I think he's trying to laugh, but Coach he's gonna have to. He's gonna have to talk to him. So I mean, tell him what do you do to get over that? I just walk away and turn it into But do you internalize it? You hold it in, or you know that's not you. You ignore it. How you do it? I ignore it and, and go do something else to get my mind off it. Okay, that's good. Okay, now uh, my baby son, Eddie, have came, so we're going to ask him yeah. the same question about how do you feel uh, being comfortable in your own skin? Eddie, and, stop touching me. And then I, I guess I have to ask you the same question I asked uh, Lena mm -hmm. yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, knowing that your biological mother is white and your father is black, what race do you identify with and why? White. Okay, so... <laughs> Before I punch you in the Eddie, y'all, stop. So, um, I want to, you know, I, I'm me. Am I about me? I mean, you can't put that on the application. <laughs> so, I'm telling you, on the application, when they say race, what do you put? Once you black, you can never go back. So, I'm black. Okay. But does it matter to you what color or? <laughs> no. It Why? don't? Why should it matter? No, it don't. Yeah, okay. It don't like now, if, if the children make fun of you, because, you know, they do that. So, how do you deal with bullying, making fun of, and because, you know, all of us got a sensitive part of our body that is sensitive to us that we feel that we don't even like. And when somebody picked that part of our body to make fun of, like, how do you keep from getting angry, exploding, getting in trouble, and all of that? Talk about it so you can help other children. Um... So you mean from my perspective? Mm hmm So, you know, I don't really get a lot of people that, like, talk about me or make fun of me or something like that because they know me. And, I mean, if they do, usually they be playing with me or something like that, and they'll just be me and my friends. I've never really had anybody besides, like, the only, see, with me, the people who try and, like, bully me and stuff, they'll usually end up putting their hands on me. And that's when it like cross tables and stuff, and that's a whole different thing in my in my book. But I don't really get bullied like that because a lot of people like me and my personality, so I don't you gotta really worry about that. Yeah, then lie. So you don't really worry about that. No, but what really what worry. about even in the kindergarten when you was coming up in kindergarten when you was very very short at first okay. before your growth spurt came. Like, was you being bullied then? And I mean, yeah, people used to call me short, and they used to say I was, like, annoying and stuff like that. Because I used to talk a lot when I was younger. But it didn't really affect me. Okay. I mean, it is what it is. Okay. So now I'm going to ask y'all a question about your, your father. Get him. Um, When, you know, after your, you know, your daddy was killed in a car accident, and, and, and some years later, after I had remarried, well, even before I remarried, how did you feel about having another father, um, Eddie? Um, you know, I told you this before. Um, I was happy because I wanted a father in the house because a lot of, when I was young, I've been hearing a lot of people like talking about, um, yeah, my father was never there and stuff like that. And I always wanted a father because mm, I just wanted a father for that. I connect more to a man than I can to a woman because a man knows when things that a boy goes through when they young. Okay. And that's why. Yeah. So when we so when I did get married, how did that change in the house? Like Oh man? no, it was very more uh I mean it really was the same because before he came he used to still beat us. Um used to like beat us with switch and stuff like that. I remember one day he came in. Yeah. I mean, it really changed. I mean, it's always been, what, well, it's always been the same. But you remember at first you used to say it was, you were going to say it was more structured. I mean. That's what you was going to say. Yeah, you were going to say but, at first y'all more like, wow. But then when your dad came, back, you brought order. Like but when I look back at it, though, like, <laughs> it really was the same, though. Okay, well, well, talk about your daddy being able to identify that you was getting abused, how God blessed him to know that. And, and were you glad, you ain't got to go into details, but were you glad that your daddy finally identified that? Yeah. You was? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
thank God for that. So, and I know you don't want to talk about that because that's touchy I'm subject. Okay, uh, Lena, how did you feel about it? I felt good because, you know, I was tired. Yeah, I felt like I was tired of meeting different men. Mm -hmm. And then, you know. 